Chapter 27 The Law Given to Israel This chapter is based on Exodus 19 to 24. Soon after the encampment at Sinai, Moses was called up into the mountain to meet with God. Alone he climbed the steep and rugged path and drew near to the cloud that marked the place of Jehovah's presence. Israel was now to be taken into a close and peculiar relation to the Most High, to be incorporated as a church and a nation under the government of God. The message to Moses for the people was, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Moses returned to the camp, and having summoned the elders of Israel, he repeated to them the divine message. Their answer was, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Thus they entered into a solemn covenant with God, pledging themselves to accept Him as their ruler, by which they became, in a special sense, the subjects of His authority. Again their leader ascended the mountain, and the Lord said unto him, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. When they met with difficulties in the way, they were disposed to murmur against Moses and Aaron, and accuse them of leading the hosts of Israel from Egypt to destroy them. The Lord would honor Moses before them, that they might be led to confide in his instructions. God purposed to make the occasion of speaking His law a scene of awful grandeur in keeping with its exalted character. The people were to be impressed that everything connected with the service of God must be regarded with greatest reverence. The Lord said to Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. During these intervening days, all were to occupy the time in solemn preparation to appear before God. Their person and their clothing must be freed from impurity. And as Moses should point out their sins, they were to devote themselves to humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that their hearts might be cleansed from iniquity. The preparations were made according to the command, and in obedience to a further injunction, Moses directed that a barrier be placed about the mount, that neither man nor beast might intrude upon the sacred precinct. If any ventured so much as to touch it, the penalty was instant death. On the morning of the third day, as the eyes of all the people were turned toward the mount, its summit was covered with a thick cloud, which grew more black and dense, sweeping downward until the entire mountain was wrapped in darkness and awful mystery. Then a sound as of a trumpet was heard, summoning the people to meet with God. And Moses led them forth to the base of the mountain. From the thick darkness flashed vivid lightnings, while peals of thunder echoed and re-echoed among the surrounding heights. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. The glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the assembled multitude. And the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder. So terrible were the tokens of Jehovah's presence that the hosts of Israel shook with fear and fell upon their faces before the Lord. Even Moses exclaimed, I exceedingly fear and quake. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21. And now the thunders ceased. The trumpet was no longer heard. The earth was still. There was a period of solemn silence, and then the voice of God was heard, speaking out of the thick darkness that enshrouded him as he stood upon the mount, surrounded by a retinue of angels, the Lord made known his law. Moses, describing the scene, says, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 2 and 3. 
Jehovah revealed himself not alone in the awful majesty of the judge and lawgiver, but as the compassionate guardian of his people. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He whom they had already known as their guide and deliverer, who had brought them forth from Egypt, making a way for them through the sea, and overthrowing Pharaoh and his hosts, who had thus shown himself to be above all the gods of Egypt, he it was who now spoke his law. The law was not spoken at this time exclusively for the benefit of the Hebrews. God honored them by making them the guardians and keepers of his law, but it was to be held as a sacred trust for the whole world. The precepts of the Decalogue are adapted to all mankind, and they were given for the instruction and government of all. Ten precepts, brief, comprehensive, and authoritative, cover the duty of man to God and to his fellow man and all based upon the great fundamental principle of love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. See also Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. In the Ten Commandments, these principles are carried out in detail and made applicable to the condition and circumstances of man. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. Man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due him, of that do we make a god. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. The second commandment forbids the worship of the true God by images or similitudes. Many heathen nations claimed that their images were mere figures or symbols by which the deity was worshipped, but God has declared such worship to be sin. The attempt to represent the Eternal One by material objects would lower man's conception of God. The mind turned away from the infinite perfection of Jehovah would be attracted to the creature rather than to the Creator, and as his conceptions of God were lowered, so would man become degraded. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The close and sacred relation of God to his people is represented under the figure of marriage. Idolatry being spiritual adultery, the displeasure of God against it is fitly called jealousy. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. It is inevitable that children should suffer from the consequences of parental wrongdoing, but they are not punished for the parents' guilt, except as they participate in their sins. It is usually the case, however, that children walk in the steps of their parents. By inheritance and example, the sons become partakers of the father's sin. Wrong tendencies, perverted appetites, and debased morals, as well as physical disease and degeneracy, are transmitted as a legacy from father to son, to the third and fourth generation. This fearful truth should have a solemn power to restrain men from following a course of sin. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In prohibiting the worship of false gods, the second commandment by implication enjoins the worship of the true God. And to those who are faithful in his service, Mercy is promised, not merely to the third and fourth generation, as is the wrath threatened against those who hate him, but to thousands of generations. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. This commandment not only prohibits false oaths and common swearing, but it forbids us to use the name of God in a light or careless manner, without regard to its awful significance. 
by the thoughtless mention of God in common conversation, by appeals to him in trivial matters, and by the frequent and thoughtless repetition of his name, we dishonor him. Holy and reverend is his name. Psalm 111, verse 9. All should meditate upon his majesty, his purity, and holiness, that the heart may be impressed with a sense of his exalted character, and his holy name should be uttered with reverence and solemnity. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath is not introduced as a new institution, but as having been founded at creation. It is to be remembered and observed as the memorial of the Creator's work. Pointing to God as the maker of the heavens and the earth, it distinguishes the true God from all false gods. All who keep the seventh day signify by this act that they are worshipers of Jehovah. Thus the Sabbath is a sign of man's allegiance to God as long as there are any upon the earth to serve him. The fourth commandment is the only one of all the ten in which are found both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority the law is given. Thus it contains the seal of God, affixed to his law as evidence of its authenticity and binding force. God has given men six days wherein to labor, and he requires that their own work be done in the six working days. Acts of necessity and mercy are permitted on the Sabbath. The sick and suffering are at all times to be cared for, but unnecessary labor is to be strictly avoided. Turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. Nor does the prohibition end here. Nor speaking thine own words, says the prophet. Those who discuss business matters or lay plans on the Sabbath are regarded by God as though engaged in the actual transaction of business. To keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character. And the commandment includes all within our gates. The inmates of the house are to lay aside their worldly business during the sacred hours. All should unite to honor God by willing service upon His holy day. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Parents are entitled to a degree of love and respect which is due to no other person. God himself, who has placed upon them a responsibility for the souls committed to their charge, has ordained that during the earlier years of life, parents shall stand in the place of God to their children. And he who rejects the rightful authority of his parents is rejecting the authority of God. The fifth commandment requires children not only to yield respect, submission, and obedience to their parents, but also to give them love and tenderness, to lighten their cares, to guard their reputation, and to succor and comfort them in old age. It also enjoins respect for ministers and rulers and for all others to whom God has delegated authority. This, says the Apostle, is the first commandment with promise. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. To Israel, expecting soon to enter Canaan, it was a pledge to the obedient of long life in that good land. But it has a wider meaning, including all the Israel of God, and promising eternal life upon the earth when it shall be freed from the curse of sin. Thou shalt not kill. All acts of injustice that tend to shorten life, the spirit of hatred and revenge, or the indulgence of any passion that leads to injurious acts toward others, or causes us even to wish them harm. For whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. A selfish neglect of caring for the needy or suffering, 
all self-indulgence or unnecessary deprivation or excessive labor that tends to injure health, all these are, to a greater or less degree, violations of the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This commandment forbids not only acts of impurity, but sensual thoughts and desires, or any practice that tends to excite them. Purity is demanded not only in the outward life, but in the secret intents and emotions of the heart. Christ, who taught the far-reaching obligation of the law of God, declared the evil thought or look to be as truly sin as is the unlawful deed. Thou shalt not steal. Both public and private sins are included in this prohibition. The Eighth Commandment condemns man-stealing and slave-dealing, and forbids wars of conquest. It condemns theft and robbery. It demands strict integrity in the minutest details of the affairs of life. It forbids overreaching in trade and requires the payment of just debts or wages. It declares that every attempt to advantage oneself by the ignorance, weakness, or misfortune of another is registered as fraud in the books of heaven. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. False speaking in any matter, every attempt or purpose to deceive our neighbor is here included. An intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. By a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, an expression of the countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectually as by words. All intentional overstatement, every hint or insinuation calculated to convey an erroneous or exaggerated impression, even the statement of facts in such a manner as to mislead, is falsehood. This precept forbids every effort to injure our neighbor's reputation by misrepresentation or evil surmising, by slander or tale-bearing, even the intentional suppression of truth, by which injury may result to others, is a violation of the Ninth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The Tenth Commandment strikes at the very root of all sins, prohibiting the selfish desire from which springs the sinful act. He who, in obedience to God's law, refrains from indulging even a sinful desire for that which belongs to another, will not be guilty of an act of wrong toward his fellow creatures. Such were the sacred precepts of the Decalogue, spoken amid thunder and flame, and with a wonderful display of the power and majesty of the great lawgiver. God accompanied the proclamation of his law with exhibitions of his power and glory, that his people might never forget the scene, and that they might be impressed with profound veneration for the author of the law, the creator of heaven and earth. He would also show to all men the sacredness, the importance, and the permanence of his law. The people of Israel were overwhelmed with terror. The awful power of God's utterances seemed more than their trembling hearts could bear. For as God's great rule of right was presented before them, they realized as never before the offensive character of sin and their own guilt in the sight of a holy God. They shrank away from the mountain in fear and awe. The multitude cried out to Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. The leader answered, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. The people, however, remained at a distance, gazing in terror upon the scene, while Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. The minds of the people, blinded and debased by slavery and heathenism, were not prepared to appreciate fully the far-reaching principles of God's ten precepts. That the obligations of the Decalogue might be more fully understood and enforced, additional precepts were given illustrating and applying the principles of the Ten Commandments. These laws were called judgments, both because they were framed in infinite wisdom and equity, and because the magistrates were to give judgment according to them. Unlike the Ten Commandments, they were delivered privately to Moses, who was to communicate them to the people. The first of these laws related to servants. 
In ancient times, criminals were sometimes sold into slavery by the judges. In some cases, debtors were sold by their creditors. And poverty even led persons to sell themselves or their children. But a Hebrew could not be sold as a slave for life. His term of service was limited to six years. On the seventh, he was to be set at liberty. Man-stealing, deliberate murder, and rebellion against parental authority were to be punished with death. The holding of slaves, not of Israelitish birth, was permitted, but their life and person were strictly guarded. The murderer of a slave was to be punished, an injury inflicted upon one by his master, though no more than the loss of a tooth, entitled him to his freedom. The Israelites had lately been servants themselves, and now that they were to have servants under them, they were to beware of indulging the spirit of cruelty and exaction from which they had suffered under their Egyptian taskmasters. The memory of their own bitter servitude should enable them to put themselves in the servant's place, leading them to be kind and compassionate, to deal with others as they would wish to be dealt with. The rights of widows and orphans were especially guarded, and a tender regard for their helpless condition was enjoined. If thou afflict them in any wise, the Lord declared, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Aliens who united themselves with Israel were to be protected from wrong or oppression. Thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. The taking of usury from the poor was forbidden. A poor man's raiment or blanket taken as a pledge must be restored to him at nightfall. He who was guilty of theft was required to restore double. Respect for magistrates and rulers was enjoined, and judges were warned against perverting judgment, aiding a false cause, or receiving bribes. Calumny and slander were prohibited, and acts of kindness enjoined, even toward personal enemies. Again the people were reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath. Yearly feasts were appointed, at which all the men of the nation were to assemble before the Lord, bringing to Him their offerings of gratitude and the first fruits of His bounties. The object of all these regulations was stated, they proceeded from no exercise of mere arbitrary sovereignty. All were given for the good of Israel. The Lord said, Ye shall be holy men unto me, worthy to be acknowledged by a holy God. These laws were to be recorded by Moses and carefully treasured as the foundation of the national law, and with the ten precepts which they were given to illustrate, the condition of the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. The message was now given them from Jehovah, Behold, I send an angel before thee, to keep thee in the way, and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries. During all the wanderings of Israel, Christ in the pillar of cloud and of fire was their leader. While there were types pointing to a Savior to come, there was also a present Savior, who gave commands to Moses for the people, and who was set forth before them as the only channel of blessing. Upon descending from the mountain, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice, and said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. This pledge, together with the words of the Lord which it bound them to obey, was written by Moses in a book. Then followed the ratification of the covenant. An altar was built at the foot of the mountain, and beside it twelve pillars were set up, according to the twelve tribes of Israel, as a testimony to their acceptance of the covenant. Sacrifices were then presented by young men chosen for the service. Having sprinkled the altar with the blood of the offerings, Moses took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. Thus the conditions of the covenant were solemnly repeated, 
and all were at liberty to choose whether or not they would comply with them. They had at the first promised to obey the voice of God, but they had since heard his law proclaimed, and its principles had been particularized that they might know how much this covenant involved. Again the people answered with one accord, All that the Lord has said will we do, and be obedient. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. Arrangements were now to be made for the full establishment of the chosen nation under Jehovah as their king. Moses had received the command, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord. While the people worshipped at its foot, these chosen men were called up into the mount. The seventy elders were to assist Moses in the government of Israel, and God put upon them his spirit, and honored them with a view of his power and greatness. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. They did not behold the deity, but they saw the glory of his presence. Before this they could not have endured such a scene, but the exhibition of God's power had awed them to repentance. They had been contemplating his glory, purity, and mercy, until they could approach nearer to him who was the subject of their meditations. Moses and his minister Joshua were now summoned to meet with God, and as they were to be some time absent, the leader appointed Aaron and Hur, assisted by the elders, to act in his stead. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain as a token of God's special presence, yet there was no revelation of himself or communication of his will. During this time Moses remained in waiting for a summons to the presence chamber of the Most High. He had been directed, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And though his patience and obedience were tested, he did not grow weary of watching, or forsake his post. This period of waiting was to him a time of preparation, of close self-examination. Even this favored servant of God could not at once approach into his presence and endure the exhibitions of his glory. Six days must be employed in devoting himself to God by searching of heart, meditation, and prayer before he could be prepared for direct communication with his Maker. Upon the seventh day, which was the Sabbath, Moses was called up into the cloud. The thick cloud opened in the sight of all Israel, and the glory of the Lord broke forth like devouring fire. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and gat him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. The forty days tarry in the mount did not include the six days of preparation. During the six days Joshua was with Moses, and together they ate of the manna, and drank of the brook that descended out of the mount. But Joshua did not enter with Moses into the cloud. He remained without, and continued to eat and drink daily, while awaiting the return of Moses. But Moses fasted during the entire forty days. During his stay in the mount, Moses received directions for the building of a sanctuary, in which the divine presence would be specially manifested. Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, was the command of God. For the third time the observance of the Sabbath was enjoined. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, the Lord declared, that ye may know that I am Jehovah that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, also verses 13 and 14. Directions had just been given for the immediate erection of the tabernacle for the service of God. 
And now the people might conclude, because the object had in view was the glory of God, and also because of their great need of a place of worship, that they would be justified in working at the building upon the Sabbath. To guard them from this error, the warning was given. Even the sacredness and urgency of that special work for God must not lead them to infringe upon His holy rest day. Henceforth the people were to be honored with the abiding presence of their King. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Exodus chapter 29, verses 45 and 43 was the assurance given to Moses. As the symbol of God's authority and the embodiment of His will, there was delivered to Moses a copy of the Decalogue engraved by the finger of God Himself upon two tables of stone. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, and Exodus chapter 32, verses 15 and 16. To be sacredly enshrined in the sanctuary, which, when made, was to be the visible center of the nation's worship. From a race of slaves, the Israelites had been exalted above all peoples to be the peculiar treasure of the King of Kings. God had separated them from the world that He might commit to them a sacred trust. He had made them the depositaries of His law, and He purposed, through them, to preserve among men the knowledge of Himself. Thus the light of heaven was to shine out to a world enshrouded in darkness, and a voice was to be heard appealing to all peoples to turn from their idolatry to serve the living God. If the Israelites would be true to their trust, they would become a power in the world. God would be their defense, and He would exalt them above all other nations. His light and truth would be revealed through them, and they would stand forth under His wise and holy rule as an example of the superiority of His worship over every form of idolatry.